Uh -oh. Okay, we're on question 33. Um, we talked last week about the King James won the Bible written. So, what are some reasons that he wanted to get an English Bible created? Right. He wanted he wanted them to read for their sales, and there's a reason for that. Why do you think that's a reason? Because again, they only used like what was it? It was in Latin. Not everybody could read Latin. Or even the other languages. Right. Everything searching said. There's several reasons. And one was he didn't agree with the Catholic Church. Right. They had full authority because they dictated what the people heard. So and uh, so he wanted to read for themselves. He wanted to have, make their own decision, be able to read for themselves, make their own decision about who has authority. Obviously, the words of God is authority over everything. Um, previous translations had been limited because of either individual or small number of people worked on it. And we've talked about a couple of them already. Um, he had three different basic beliefs back in. And King James didn't agree with any of them. He had, of course, you had the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't agree with that. They had the, uh, these are just kind of like fitness for you. The Roman Catholic Church had, they wanted total control. They wanted total authority. And he didn't agree with that. Then you had the Anglo-Catholics, Anglo Angelicans. They wanted to maintain um, the English church, but they was very liberal. They didn't agree with that. And then you had the Puritans. They uh, they went against the Catholic Church, but they was uh, very strict. And they agree with that. So he wanted a Bible that had to be authoritative, God's word. Okay. And he thought the Bible would be a good thing to have also to keep the three groups in check. Okay. Didn't he also specifically request to not have any, like, commentary in it, too? Because the previous versions had commentary in there to kind of explain stuff, but he wanted it to not have commentary so that everyone would be able to basically come to their own conclusion. I don't know about that, but I can believe that. Commentaries... You have to be very careful with it. Because it's man's interpretation. So, I, do I read commentaries? Yes, I do. But you can be very careful. They can mislead you if you ain't careful. So don't take one commentary like, you know, if I read this commentary, it's all I read. Be very careful, be very cautious. Make sure you rightly divide the word. Now, when you finished last Sunday, mm -hmm. I, I made a note, this artificial intelligence, and Gen Z or whatever. Mm -hmm. This all will interfere if we're not careful with our biblical values. That it's, it's made up stuff. Right. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking, I'm kind of glad you brought that up. There was a little bit of tension last week over that discussion. <laughs> but it's like this. You know, is there foolishness out there? Absolutely. There's a lot of garbage out there. But at the same time, we have to know what we're up against. We have to know the enemy's weapons. If, if I, probably a lot of y'all seen Top Gun movie, okay? The last one that came out, Maverick. He goes up to the class. He's got the manual to the fighter plane, okay? He said, y'all know this manual? I said, yep. He played the class. He said, so does your enemy. So you don't have any advantages. You know your enemy's tactics. So it's like going into battle, not knowing what your enemy's throwing at you out there. So, Good you know, did I, did I spend a half a day reading Gen Z stuff? No, it didn't take me long. I, I've seen enough. But we need to have junks out there so we can arm our kids against it. Exactly. Really I think it's misled. not just the language that they say they want their language. It's rewriting it to fit their, the way they feel about it. It's, just, it's rewriting it to fit the way they feel about it. Uh, their agenda. Okay, so this is something I kind of wonder about. 
Oh, well, Mike, what is it? You've heard authorized King James Bible. What does it mean, authorized? But this is the only Bible that is, as is authorized. Why do they say that? Well, they, the authorized means the, that means that it was like the original one that they, like the original, original one. That's the only one that, you know, after they had their whole committee thing and everything, the King James that we have. You're, you're getting there. King James is a man of great authority, authorized that finished product after all the committees and stuff to be read in the churches. He authorized that. He's a king, great authority man, great authority, authorized that Bible, the King James Version Bible, to be read in the churches. Well, wasn't it also because of the manuscripts and the scrolls that they authorized to be legitimate? Well, that's what the, the 54 people, the committees, the six committees, had to weed right, through to find what was legit and what wasn't. Because there, was, there was some garbage back like then, too, which we'll get in all that. It's kind of like he's like, this is the official Bible. Right. Okay. Uh, Thirty-five. What was the main issue with the previous translations? There were some. There was some translations out there before the King James. They were done by individuals or small number of people, and it wasn't complete. So they had some issues. It was better than nothing, I guess, but it wasn't complete. Now, thirty-six. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Here in a few minutes, I'm actually going to talk about some of the men that was on the translation committee, and you can see that some of the different backgrounds that went into this work. And it's amazing because you get you get four people to to agree on something nowadays. You've done something. We had 54 people that did and come up with God's work. <clears throat> but yeah, Steph's right. Toyota. One thing I was told because I knew some people that worked there, and they told me when you sent a resume in. When you have the interview, don't use personal pronouns. Don't say, I did this or I've done that. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear what? This person helped me to do this. They want that teamwork. They're big on that. That's one reason they don't go for unions, because unions anti-teamwork as far as the company goes. Okay. All right. 36. What did King James do to correct this issue? He went and asked English bishops to nominate Greek and Hebrew scholars to be on a translation committee. He went and asked English bishops to nominate some Greek and Hebrew scholars. So that's one of the lies out today, some of these modern versions. They'll tell you that the people on the original translation committee didn't know the Greek and Hebrew. Yeah, they did. There's experts in it. Experts. So that's a lie. How many scholars were there? There's 54, I just 10 minutes ago, there's 54 of them. Okay, 38. What are some of the different background of the scholars selected? 
And I'm going to go over some of this and we're going to do some Bible. What are some different backgrounds of, okay, they was Greek and Hebrew scholars, first of all. A lot of them was preachers. That's good. Those professors of Hebrew. One guy knew over 15 languages. That's amazing. He said he he, sometimes he'd go on vacation learn a language in a month. That's pretty smart. They was great men of prayer. Some of them had a reputation. They had a, a name of prayer. And there was people in that committee that was Catholics that were converted to Christianity. So they had some Catholic background as well. Now you think about that diversity of people there to make those kind of committees that come up with a final conclusion. Okay, just real quick, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over some of the people on that translation committee. One guy named was Lancelot Andrews. This guy was a master dean and bishop. He's like I said, he's one that earned 50 vacations. He was a great preacher, and he was known as a great man of prayer. He's actually called a star of preachers. So that guy, Master Dean and Bishop. What was his name? Lancelot Andrews. Lancelot Andrews. He had, I'm going to go about four or five of them here. He had another name on Lawrence Chatterton. Lawrence Chatterton. He was a master. He was raised a Roman Catholic and became a lawyer. Okay, he was converted to Christ. He was, it says, thoroughly skilled in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. He was known as a powerful preacher. This guy lived to be 103. And this is something I thought was pretty cool. I'm just going to read this word for word. Having addressed his audience for two full hours by the glass, he paused and said, I will no longer trespass on your patience. And now comes the marvel. And the whole congregation cried out with one consent, for God's sake, go on. Wow. That's pretty good preaching, I guess, ain't it? How many, how many nowadays you listen to two hours of preaching? I want more. I had a guy named John Reynolds. John Reynolds. He was a president of Corpus Christi and the dean of Lincoln. He was, raised in Rome, he was raised in Roman Catholicism, and he trusted Christ and became a Puritan. So now we got Catholics and we got a Puritan on the committee. He devoted himself to the state of scriptures, the Greek and Latin, and ancient records of the church. So that's on his background. Another guy named Miles Smith. He was a bishop and a doctor. He was a Greek and Latin expert, as well as in Chaldean. Eric and Aramaic, Arabic, and he was known as a walking library. He was known as a very walking library. And the last one, I mean, there's a bunch of them here. I'm just hitting some of the high points. The last one is William John Bois. I'm saying B O I S Bois. His father taught in Hebrew, age five. When he was six, he could write. These guys was intelligent respectable, honorable men, okay? Now, I want you to think about that because later I'm gonna talk about somebody's on the committee of NIV and you're like, wow. <laughs> can, can you imagine now if you would take, like, the preachers, uh, the We can't get our own congregation within itself to ground up to everything, can we? That's a lot of stuff to come to consensus and have a total agreement on. Okay, one more thing, and we'll get some Bible. How many? Uh, yeah, how many committees were made from the 54? There were six committees of the 54, and they worked at three separate locations. So there's six different committees. Okay, now, I want to show you some stuff. A couple of volunteers. Yes, God, he, he, he yes, God. Right, you, Chuck, you want to read a little bit? You're a good reader. <clears throat> now, no, no tricks this week. The verses are in there. They're different, though. 
So what are we getting into comparing what? We're going to talk about how they have diminished uh, the Bible. Okay. Okay. And where is my notes on this? Okay. First of all, I'm actually going to hand these out after we're done. So you see what I went over today, okay? This is good stuff. Or it's bad stuff, however you want to look at it. Alright, so what does the word diminish mean? Something diminished, what's that mean? Alright, very good. The less and to make less important to degrade, right? Take away from exactly. Now, I'm gonna read the King James version, and then I'll have the other two read their versions. Can you tell me what word's missing? This is Colossians one two. Colossians one two. King James Bible says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are Colossians. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your say, Chubb? Well, anything. <laughs> He's got the little print, sorry. Yeah. Brother Roy had that in her a while back. I don't think he liked it either. Go ahead, Scott. Don't look at two. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's why you need to stick. That's why you need to stick to King James Bible. You can't find the stuff. See. We got both of them. Colossians one two. While they're looking, I won't read nothing but the King James Bible, but I've got a, a King James uh, teaching Bible that you know tells you what other people think when you read and check. And there's words in it different from this King James Bible to that King. This is a new version of the King James Bible. And it has different words in it than what this one does. Yeah, we're going to talk about that one too. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Okay, yeah, yeah. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossus, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Right. Until we cut out Jesus Christ. Gotcha. Nice. So also, saints in that, right? Yeah. What about you, Chad? What's your say? Now what verse are we looking at? Colossians 1, 2. For I once you to know how great the struggle I had for you and for those. Colossians 1, 2. Verse 2. 1, 2. Colossians. And the faithful brothers in Christ. Great to you and the peace from God our Father. Okay. So they both left out Jesus Christ, for one, right? You notice how these word a little bit different, but they left out the same key stuff? <coughs> these are different versions. Okay? If I want you to get to this lesson, the modern versions use a different text than the King James Bible. That's what I'm trying to teach y'all. And we're going to learn so much before we're done. I'm just tipping the iceberg here. Okay, same book of the Bible. Go to verse 28. Read that for me there, Scotty. Verse 28, same chapter. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And to this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Okay, what about you, uh, Joe? And we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggle, struggle with all this energy that he powerfully works within me. Okay. So here we got Christ, but we don't have Jesus, do we? No. So. That's the thing, these new, these new versions, 
they will they won't take something completely out, but they'll take it out in a lot of different areas. So I want y'all to see they're, they're they're not doing you right. Let's go to Second Corinthians five eighteen. What was it? Second Corinthians five eighteen. Second Corinthians five eighteen. King James Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us to the minister of reconciliation. Okay, Scotty. Corinthians 518. You want to read it? 518, you just read it, didn't you? Uh, there, he, it's, 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 the lessons want to show up and how different Bibles and stuff out. Later, Chuck, you got ESV and take that in. I like the right one. All this is. From God, who through Christ reaches out us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And you hear again and left Jesus out again, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Now, wait till you see this. I'm going to do one more. Um, wait till you see this. That's blow your mind. Let's go to Ephesians 3 14. 3 14. Now, a lot of the things they'll tell you in these new modern versions are easy to understand. What's so hard to understand about Jesus? That's why. Ephesians 3.14. Got it? For well, this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family, in heaven and in, on earth, derives its name. Okay, Chad. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, Okay. King James Bible. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He took out Lord Jesus Christ from out of it. Yeah, you can't get to God without going to Jesus. So that exactly. Exactly. Well, that was one of the scriptures in the very birth. It's the virgin would conceive, bring, bring forth the Son, and call his name Jesus, being interpreter. God be with us. I mean, that's, you know, Savior also. There's two references, and one is Savior. So if you leave Jesus out, I see your point. You missed it. You can the whole Bible. Now, what does Acts 4, 10 through 12 say? Let's, let's go to that. Everybody go to that. Acts 4, 10 through 12. Somebody read that for me. Acts 4, 10 through 12. So they diminished Jesus. And these four texts we just looked at, they diminished Jesus Christ. Took him out. Be it known unto you all and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you all. Oh, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Okay. All right, so what name? Uh, the only name under heaven where a man should be saved? Jesus. Jesus, and they took him out. Took him out. That's scary stuff. Is that new international? The one Scott has, is that, um, it seems to me like that's Jehovah's Witness news, that Bible. They got their own Bible. I'll say that one doesn't see another one. Yeah, that's another one. The Jehovah's Witness has a different Bible. Yeah. So you see, like the Catholics have their own Bible. 
I want to say it's a promise, Bob, if I can't be sure yet. Because I, 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 well, I won't go there. In the Catholic Bible, I've never saw one of them before. But it, the only big difference in the Catholic Bible is they have one more chapter in the Torah. Yeah. 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 What? What is the Catholic? The Torah is the first four books of the Bible. Five books. Five books. Is that what they use? Shay, this is. Um, I saw this the other day. It's not only just the Bibles that they're messing with. It's everything. And the biggest thing that they try to, of course, us, but if you start young, you've even got a, a better chance to target our kids. These little Bible books that you pick up, like at Tollies or whatever, to uh, teach about Jesus, and you think you're doing so good about um, giving it to your grandkids, read them first. You wouldn't think that they're being corrupted even in the children's books, but they are. Here's a book about uh, when Jesus was baptized by John. It says, uh, John asked him, he says, why do you want me to baptize you, asked John. You should be baptizing me. I have come to the river today to wash my sins away, said Jesus. That's it. Wow. wow. Well, here we are. Scriptural, if we say it, be not deceived whatsoever a man so if he shall surely reap. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this, this is a good point of where we are. It starts out just a little bit, then it's another verse, then it's another phase, and now it's a whole book. Yep. But be not deceived. Okay. So, <clears throat> we'll get back to our lesson. I'll go over, I'm going to pass these out here in a minute. Uh, we went over the top half, so the bottom half, we'll go over next week, or we'll. You want me to pass them out? Yeah, if you want to. Next week, we'll talk about the word holy. Yes. Yes. So, are you talking about the committees, the translating committees? There's 54 of them. Now, were there any rules made to ensure accuracy of the work? Yes. And so what, does anybody know how many rules there was? Fifteen rules. Fifteen rules. I'll give you a few of them. When the committee completed the work, of course they had to review. Now here, here's something that's pretty amazing. They had to submit their work to the other committees and they had to review it. Make any kind of corrections or whatever if they didn't leave all of the necessary. So everybody's reviewing each other's work. That's pretty amazing. Through six different committees. All right. They also send their work to other learned men to have them review it. So this stuff was checked and rechecked and double checked. It was just checked to death. Okay. After everything was reviewed, it went before a final board of six. They took one out of each committee, like the head of each committee, had them review the final work again. Then they sent it to the printers. So, I mean, this was very scrutinized. Like I said before, when, uh, if you would take a uh, committee of the Baptists and the Nazarenes and the Jehovah's Witnesses and all that stuff, and All right, so. Double. It did a first in Christ. Isn't that Jesus? Well, some, yeah, some of us might know that. But what about people who are new Christians? They might not know that. Why take it out? Why take Jesus out? Well, Well, isn't there Antichrist? You say there's many Christ I didn't think about that. But there, there's actually people in the Bible named Jesus that aren't the Jesus. Well, 
what is translated as Jesus. Yeah, that's true. Or Jesus. Okay, so how many exam forty two? How many examinations did the King James Bible uh, translation go through for one to press? I actually went through 14 different examinations. And if you're all in the numbers, that's two times seven. Seven's complete, perfect. And then, <laughs> there's no way I'm gonna try to ever explain it here because it makes my head spin. There's a, there's a guy that is a, like an expert in these numbers and stuff in the Bible, and he shows so many sevens through the Bible, it makes your head spin. You can't deny that this is inspired and holy. I mean, the stuff he ties together just blows your mind. It is really deep. Uh, 43, I'm going to stop here because the next part we're going to go to is about italicized words. I don't want to break that up in the middle. That's kind of important. So number 43, is there any significance in the number 14? 14 represents double perfection or even salvation, which I thought was kind of cool. Represent salvation, double perfection. Now next week, um, I'm going to talk about italicized words and give you some examples of why they're important, why the translators put them in there, how they was transparent about it. Um, pretty neat stuff. And then we're going to talk about, well, as you, you're already seeing there, you got a little cheat sheet there for next week. We're going to talk about the word holy taken out of the Bible. It shouldn't have been. Okay, you don't have anything else, I'll stop there for this time. This morning, I just want to tell my two cents worth of <laughs> I'm going to be in Matthew 6, and we'll go through it. Something that's very dear to me is prayer. I'm a, I'm a, I don't pray much in, around people. I'm just not that kind of person. But I pray, and I, I have to laugh sometimes when, as I, when I finish praying, I think about some of the things that I've said because I always try to make sure my prayer comes from my heart. But I always, as I pray, I pray for the church. But as I pray for the church, I pray for the church the way you said. So don't change around much. <laughs> I think you think about it and you think about how people said it as you pray for them each day. And new people come in to the church, and thank God for that. <coughs> the new people come in, I forget their names. I don't, I'm going to have names I'm terrible with. But what I will say, El Sue, we used to know a couple. It was called T-Ray and uh, Peggy. Peggy. I couldn't remember Tim and Peggy's name. I just couldn't remember. And I'd have to say, well, the, the one that sits there in front of Don, but we're done Oh, yeah. Too, and that's what I tell him. But see, it's, it's what you pray. We think about as we pray. Do we, when we pray, do we pray from our heart? Are we really sincere in our prayer? You know, or do we pray to be heard? You know what I'm saying? True. Are we, are we sincere? We have to be sincere with prayer. But I'm going to start out with a little old simple word here this morning. We're going to start out with alms. It's a little simple, tiny little word. And it says, take heed that you, uh, that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. And, you, and, we think, and I think about that, and I think about so many people, and you watch these politicians and stuff, and all the different people in the world, they want to stand up and say, look what i done. Look at me. Well, they're getting all the credit they're going to get is right there to themselves. And that's what he's telling us here. He's telling us, you know, you're not going to get anything from the glory of men. Man's not going to get you anywhere. He said, but I'm going to go on it. Just, I want you to remember that word. And I want you to remember one more word, Father. As I go through this message this morning, Father's mentioned 14 times just in this one chapter. And it said, in Matthew 23, it says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for your father, you only have one, and he's in heaven. And I often hear people, and I always say, I'll hear people say, well, my father is not your dad. Your father's in heaven. Remember that. But he says, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. 
They love to stand in the synagogues and the corners. They're, they're praying to be heard of man. Think about that this morning. When you pray, do you pray? As you pray, where do you pray at? Where do you, where do you go to pray? Each morning when I get up, I kneel beside my bed and I pray. Each night when I go to bed, I kneel beside my bed and pray. But I always shut that door to that bedroom where it's quiet. Because I want to make sure when I pray, he hears what I'm taught, what I want him to hear. I, hear, I pray for each and every person in this church every day. Every day. And I would never miss one of you for nothing in the world. But, but we have to be sincere in prayer. Prayer is so important. You know, we think, I, I, it's, I think about the times that I pray for my brother not to die. But you see, what we do have when we pray, we have to pray for the will of God, not our will. Maybe our will is not as good as his is. I know our will is not as good as his. But we still pray, Lord, don't take my brother from me. Don't take Mikey from me, Lord. We pray. We pray because that's what's in our heart. That's what we feel. And that's what we should pray if we pray. We have to pray from here. Not from up here. Sometimes this gets me this gets me in more trouble because I'll use this first. We have to be so careful. Be so careful what we say. He said, now pray us in the closet, shut the door, pray in secret. When you pray in secret, you'll be rewarded openly. He said, but when you pray, use not vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard of much speaking. And if you listen here in Matthew, he's talking, what he's talking about is people that are just out here, I guess back in, in, in those days, they prayed a lot on the streets and on the corners of the buildings and stuff just to be seen. Those people, those Pharisees and all these guys like that, they, they wanted to be seen. They, they wanted everybody to know, hey, look at me. Hey, look at me. <clears throat> I don't want to be seen. I missed a note, and I'm sorry. But when you pray, use not vain repetition as they even do, for they think they shall be heard for much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. How many of us, when we sit down to pray, Lord, how about getting me this? Help me with this. Do this for me. How about doing that for me? How many of you pray for yourself? Think about it. That's something I rarely ever do, is pray for myself. But, but we think about it. Do we pray for ourselves? Do we ever pray for ourselves? Sometimes we need to pray for ourselves. Lord, help me get through this. There are trials we will have in this earth that we have to, as we pray. We have to say, Lord, help me through this. Help me get through this. You know, <laughs> be not ye therefore like them, for your Father knoweth what you have need of before you ask. So why? You know, he knows what we need before we even ask him. But does he know, he knows what each and every one of us needs here this morning. True. He said, and after this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. Then I go back again, he says, call no man Father upon this earth. But the Lord's Prayer, if, if we would just think about the Lord's Prayer, our Father which is in heaven. We know that God is in heaven today. We know he's sitting there and Jesus Christ is on the right hand of God interceding for you and I. And he said, thy kingdom come. His kingdom's gonna come one day. We, we say this prayer every Sunday, but if, if we would just kind of break this prayer down and what it's telling us in these prayer, what, God, what Jesus has told them how to pray, just a simple little prayer. He said, there, there, thy will be done on earth. And we know his will is going to be done no matter what we say. <coughs> Give us this day our daily bread. How many of us is hungry in here this morning? Hungry for the word. Uh -huh. Hungry for the word. Right. 
But then you think about, him, I, you know, I think about that, bro, what he's saying there. Throw me off, bro. I'm sorry. Got me, my main <laughs> mind. <Yeah. laughs> he said, that daily bread. And, and as I was studying this, I'm not gonna lie, I sat down and kind of, I had to laugh. Because I got to thinking, so well, your daily bread. And I said, do you ever go hungry? And I said, well, does that look like I got hungry? You think about that. But we think about that this morning, don't you say, well, our daily bread. But, but Wesley. Wesley had a good point. We have to hunger for the word. And that's a good point. Hunger for the word. Hunger for the Right. Amen. Amen. He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I often think about that. And, and one of my biggest things to say is, I wouldn't loan you a dime, but I'd give you money if you needed to. Anything I could do to help you, I would do it. But I don't do it with the except of receiving back. I do it because I think that that's what you need. We too many times we'll, we'll do something, and especially when we think about the lust of money. Filthy Lacrue, I can't get that word, never could say it. But we think about that word, and we think about when we, we do something, you know, we, you come over to the house and well, don't you, I need a loaf of bread, or I need a, a little bit of salt, or sugar, or whatever you may need. And you go over, and they come and get it, and you never think about it anymore. But let them walk into your house and say, can you lend me $10? Do you ever think about that $10 anymore? Sure you do. I don't. I don't care. Money doesn't mean nothing to me. If I've got it, that's good shape. If I've got it, I'll spend it. If I don't, I don't worry about it. But we think what I'm trying to point, point out is the material, some of the material things is not that important to us. So we know we can go to the store, get a loaf of bread, a thing of salt. You know, it's not that much. But, but, but when you put that money in there to it, that, that goes in at all. Hey, look, I need that. That's half tank of gas. Well, quarter tank of gas. But, but the thing is, when it comes to money, we think about it. But when it comes to things of the, uh, you know, that we use every day, we never give it any thought. And lead us not into temptation. I, I had a message on temptation here not too long ago. And what he tells us, we'll never be tempted more than we can bear. And if we are tempted, he will give us a way out. Think about that this morning. Deliver us from evil. How many of us have evil? How much evil is in this world today? Think about the evil that's in this world today. You know, you, you sit down and, and you talk to people, and, and after you and I both try to talk to people about that they should come to church and do right. the things that we think that they should do. But not, not necessarily, now maybe that's not the right way to say that, but we do what's good that would be good for them, what would help them. And I would ask each and every one of you this morning, if I was to ask you, before you became a Christian, what was your life like? After you became a Christian, what was your life like? And think about it. I don't worry much. I'm not a worrier. Never was. But, but my life is so much better since I became a Christian than it was before. Well, you say, well, how's it better? As I warn you, you'll see a little more here in just in a minute. How's my life better? I've always had goals. I always wanted to do, do this or do that, you know, things that we've had. And I asked you this morning, I would ask each and every one of you to write down this morning, what is your goal? What is your goal today? And I've got one goal. Yeah. <clears throat> Make it to heaven. Amen. I'm sorry. Make it to heaven. Amen. 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 Turn off. For if you forgive the trespassers, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not me and their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And I think about forgiving, about forgiving things. And, and we think about things that happens in the world that hurt your little feelings, all the little things that happen. You said, well, I forgive you. You're thinking it's okay, I forgive you. But I'll bet you there's not one of you can say, I'll forgive you. <coughs> 
down at this altar. What did he do? What's what, He thought every sin you had in this world, he threw it away. No more sin. He forgot that. But he not only forgot it, he forgave you. It's right. easy to forget. To forget. It's two different things. <laughs> he said it. Over in uh, James, I, the little verse there I was reading is this one. He said, For the, he shall ju have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. And enjoy. You enjoy. How many of you have got mercy? Mercy. All of us. All have yeah, mercy. We all should have mercy. Every one of us. But there's sometimes you say, you'll say things before you think. And, and you can let that mercy slip away. You know, I, I used to be when I, we drive down the road and I see these people here standing on, there's commercial TV. What do you need? What do you need? I need, some money. I need this or I need that. And I always look over that too and I say, the main thing they need is a job. Oh, you're going to need that person. <laughs> <laughs> but you think about that what do we need what do we need in this world today we need clothes I don't want people laughing at me we need food <laughs> what do we need we need the love of Jesus Christ we need the love of Jesus Christ and you know he gives that love freedom he doesn't say well, I don't like the way you love I don't like the way you dress. He doesn't say any of that. He gives it freedom. Moreover, no, I'm going to go through this a little bit. I, I really don't want to say a whole lot about fasting because fasting is that's a choice. You know, and it's, it's like me and uh, Norman was talking before church this morning about something. A lot of things we do. It tells you in the Bible you should fast. And, and believe me, I've, I've thought about this a lot in, in this little verse here we'll go through. I've thought about fasting a lot. And when you fast, you know, I'll ask you this. When you fast, what, what do you fast with? What do you use as your fasting? You know, what do you, uh, do you not eat for the day? Do you not drink coffee for the day? Whatever your drink may be, or what is it? When you fast, what do you give up? Give up everything. And we say, okay, how long do you fast? Do you fast for a day? A week? It doesn't really tell you. But he tells you when you fast. 40 days. I couldn't hear you, so I'll just talk. Go ahead, go ahead. He said, uh, but I'm going to go on. He said, lay down treasures upon the earth for moth and rough filled crowd, where thieves break through and steal. And you know, we can have all the treasures we want. We can have, let's just say, let's just use money, for instance. We can have in the bank. We can have. $10 million in the bank. The government can come by in a minute and take every penny out. And there's nothing you can do. But if you have your treasures in heaven and you do right. the things that you're supposed to do, they can't nobody on this earth take it from you. Nobody. The only person that can take away your treasures that are in heaven is you. Amen. And nobody else. Good. And it's your, but it's a choice. It's just like forgiving. It's a choice that you have to make to forgive someone. And it's right. a choice what you want to do. It's a choice where you want to go. Do you want to be in heaven one day where the streets are paved with gold? I don't care what the streets are paved up. I want to be there. I want to be in heaven someday. But do you want to be in hell where there's a fire that burns eternally? That's a choice that you make. I can't make it for you. Roy can't make it for you. No one. You have to make it for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's your choice. He said, <clears throat> of 
Because what does he say? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Think about that this morning. Where is your treasure and where's your heart? But lay up treasures in heaven, where moth, moth and rust is not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. Over in Timothy, it says, laying up store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold of eternal life. I see, that's what we want to save up. That's what we want to build up. We want to build up these things. That, that makes, that makes, I always say, Lord, let me do what you would have me to do and keep me out of your way. Sometimes we get in his way. It's like, I, I've done something here I don't think too proud of, but me and Elsie Sue were going through the hospital and I passed this room and something just come to me that I need to stop and pray with this people. And I didn't do it. That will never, ever happen again. I don't care if they're Catholic. I don't care what they are. If God puts something in here, we have to follow up on it. We have to do those things that God asks us to do. We sometimes will have that little silent voice in us and we'll hear just like, you need to do this or you need to do that. And we just kind of pass it off. That's the way. Do what he puts in your heart. They said, if the eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore is light, there is in the no be darkness. How great is that darkness? And I think about the lust of the eye when we think about our eyes. And I've often wondered, but just kind of thinking, I wonder if the, the, a blind person can't lust in the eye. You think about that this morning. But, but we, we can lust with our eye. We can look at things and want things or do things. We have that lust of our eye. So what do we have to do? We have to keep our spirit. We have to keep on looking forward. Keep on looking forward. One day, one day, we'll get our reward. But one day, when you do this, you're done messed up. Don't look back. You can't go back. You say something today and you can't take it back. Well, as soon as it comes out, you can't take it back. He said, now you can't. No man can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other. You can't serve man and money. That's what mammon means. But you can't serve man and God. There's so many people try to serve man and God. And that won't work. That's not going to work, no matter what we think. Serve God with all your heart. He said, Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow, neither do they reap, nor grass in the barn, or gather into the barn. Yet your heart, heavenly Father feedeth them as ye not much better than they. This verse comes in just now. Bear with me just one second, okay? Because this is a... Can't find, I, I'm spend, but I think about it. And I think about the, 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 the man that had, had, had a bountiful harvest, just had more than he could do. He said, what am I, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I'm just going to tear my barn down. I'm going to build a barn down. I'm going to build me a bigger barn. And that way I'd just be set for life. But he didn't know that God was going to call him. Jesus was going to call him to the next. His soul was going to be gone. We have to be prepared each day. Every minute of each day, we have to be prepared because we don't know when he's going to call our name. And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lowly field how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I've often think about what, how we wear. 
what we wear. And, and, and I think about, I think this is what I think. So morning we're sitting here in church. We're all going around greeting each other, glad to see you and all that. Guy walks off the street, got big old jeans on, the cerebral side is too big, one holes on me, and face is dirty, hair and things on. What would you do? Greet it like you greet each other this morning. Yeah. Okay. Think about it. Think about it. Because fear comes in. Are we afraid of things? Are we, are we as people afraid of things? Think about a guy walking here with the long hair. You never know what people are going to do. And I'm like you. I'm going to do my best to make sure it go well. Don't get me wrong. But we think about what would we do. Therefore I say, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? But through all shall we be clothed. Everything that not a one of us here this morning is hungry. Not a one of us here this morning don't have clothes to wear. Amen. Think about it. We've got cars to drive. You know, we can drive as far as we want to drive to come to church, whatever. We've got clothes to wear. We've got everything we need. And I'm going to go on here, but seek ye first. No, I'm sorry. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. None of us is going without, I'm sure. None of us. We all have what we need, what we want. A lot of times what we want and what we need are two different things. But we have everything we want we need. He said, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow should take thought of the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And, and you think about that this morning. Do we, uh, could, can we go back and change yesterday? No. Can we do anything to change today? Nope. We can do a lot to change today. But we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Worry about today. If you're gonna worry, worry about what you're gonna to do today. Because tomorrow may be here. Any of us here this morning that's not prepared to meet Jesus Christ, this altar is always open. But we'll always come with you. We'll always pray with you. It's a choice you have to make. But I've got one more little thing here, and I'll shut up. This is over in, in uh, Luke 17. He said, and he spake a par parable to them, saying, this is the verse I was looking for. I'm sorry. But I'm going to read it anyway. He said, and he thought, and said, brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruit. How many of you has got a room? I want you to think about this. Has got a room. We've got a room. <laughs> it's probably, we'll say 12 by 16. That'd be about right. 12 by 12, maybe. That thing is full. Uh, and then you got the two get some more stuff. Well, yeah, you're going to get trouble. <laughs> but you think about it. But think of what the point I'm trying to make, and that's kind of it's funny because it really is. But the point I'm trying to make, we have a room, we have a, a house full of stuff. Every one of us, we, we just got a house full of stuff. That The biggest part of it, I worked for a company one time that, that was the same way. We would... <clears throat> Had these little they, they were they're called seals. They seal the liquid from the uh, uh, the inner workings of the pumps, we'll say. And those seals were super expensive. So what we'd do is, as guys mechanics that are in the shop, we'd take those seals and we had a lapping machine and, and rebuild little things and rebuild them with and rebuild those seals. But the company would always charge the full price. So what we'd do, we'd, we'd get us a bunch and we'd hide them back. And, and good customers that were really good to us, sometimes we just kind of help them out. But you think about that. You, you store up all this stuff, and we've all got stuff. And he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns, I'll build graver, and there I'll bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, 
So thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This morning, if you couldn't go to the grocery store tomorrow, if you couldn't go buy groceries day after tomorrow, if you couldn't go buy groceries Friday, would you have enough food in the house to eat? Sure we would. But think about it. The things that, that, that we have, we don't appreciate the things that we have that God provides for us. We have a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> and he said, I'll say to my soul, thou hast laid up much good, laid up many years. Take down easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I've always heard the old say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. How yeah. many of you have ever heard that old say? Think about that. It's true. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thou shalt be required of thee. Thou soul shall be required of thee. And who shall these things be which thou hast provided? Now this morning, if we all pass away, which we'll all be appointed to death, the man wants to die. If we don't, if we die tomorrow, what are what are they going to do with all this stuff we have? They're going to take it to the dump. They're going to throw it away. Because it's, it's not important to me. What's important to you? That's a question I'll close with this morning. What is important to you? What is important to you? Is eternal life important? Or where are you going to go to eat lunch at after you leave here? Where? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll sleep in the side of the taco there. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to leave that for her, but don't ask me. Don't ask me. <laughs> now, Lord, if, if anyone here this morning really hasn't, are not prepared to meet Jesus Christ, please, please, I beg of you. Get it in your heart. Right. That it, it's there. Right. Get it Put that stuff in your heart. All this stuff you see in the world, it's worldly goods. And it has no importance when it all comes down to one thing. When we all stand before Jesus Christ, and yet we have to stand before judgment, each and every one of us, for all the things that we have done while we're on this earth. Now, so we was talking yesterday, and I let, I've talked to you about this before. Remember on your tombstone, it's got date born, date died. What have you done in this world? Think about that. That's we don't call it stuff, we call it treasures. <laughs> <laughs> that will soon got plenty of treasures, I'll tell you that. 